Lord. We are just asking you, Lord, Father, to open the eyes and ears of our hearts, Lord Jesus. Bring understanding to our hearts and our souls, Father. Help our minds process these things that you have given us. Because, Father, the truth sets us free. Anything but the truth keeps us in bondage. And so, Father, as we begin to see the full truth, Father, just allow it, allow it to just stick. We thank you, Lord. We love you and praise you. In your precious name we pray, amen. So there's a word. Um, it's called proclaim. All right. Now, it's funny because... Um, Few, few have the understanding or few have stood in the proclamation of God. We, we proclaim to know him. We proclaim to worship him. We proclaim to follow him. We proclaim to be doers, but we don't understand the proclamation that was laid forth way back when in the beginning of time. Why? Because that becomes uncomfortable. See, there's a lot of pastors that will never touch the Old Testament. Want to know why? Because it sets a standard. It sets a standard. And, and that standard that is set is the standard that God says, this is what I want you to live by. So the word proclamation in the Hebrew is kira. And in Jonah 3... 1, verse 1, this is what it says. The word of God came to the prophet Jonah a second time. God said, get up, get up and go to the powerful, and listen to this, notorious city of Nineveh. In other words, your trip is not going to be peaches, roses, and ice cream. Because the because Nineveh in this place is not a fun place to be. So I want you to get up and I want you to go to the powerful and notorious Nineveh and pass on to them this message, this proclamation. Pass this on to them. I'm giving you Having learned his lesson, Jonah yielded to God's command and headed on the road to Nineveh. We see here that God gave Jonah words to give to Nineveh. God gave Isaiah words to give to who? The Israelites. David to bring to Balthazar and Nebuchadnezzar. We see words of all the major and minor prophets that were brought from who? From God. And what did God do? He commanded them to bring these words forward. And then what happened? Breakdown in communication. And the breakdown in communication led to sin. I know people, oh, don't there's that word sin. Sin is a calculable, a calculable decision to go against God. You have thought about, you have decided to, and you've chosen to go against God. That is sin. It's not called, oh, I, I had a memory lapse. I forgot. It's called sin. And I've told you, nothing but the truth is ever going to come from this pulpit. So we study it. And sin is a calculable, calculable decision to go against God. We've chosen. We've thought about it. We've decided. And so Jonah, we know Jonah had done that a couple of times with God when God said, go to Nineveh. And then God commanded Jonah to go. Why? Because Jonah, Jonah had a bad, a bad thing about Nineveh. He had bad thoughts about Nineveh. And what happens with bad thoughts? They enter into sin. It leads us into sin. Now, Kira 
is from Kara, Q-A-R-A. And Kara means to call as well as proclaim. And I love this, read. So in other words, Jonah was told and commanded to go and proclaim. He was called to go. Now I got to tell you something. Remember, remember Joshua? He was commanded to tell everybody every time they passed those rocks about the history of why they were where they were, how they got there, and the most important part is what God had done. But you know what happens, because it happens to us, we get lackadaisical, lazy, and just, and we try to find a shortcut. So I can see is, you know, maybe the first four months, five months, five years, Joshua, every time they went by, said the story, and then all of a sudden it became, yeah, there's that pile of rocks again. If you want to know about them, just ask. And probably people are going, Jonah's or Joshua's kind of skipped a beat there somewhere. He t- wants to talk to us about a pile of rocks. See? This is how it ha- this is how it happens. It's a lulling. It's a lulling. And so in that lulling of being told, I have given you this, what did Jesus say? Go out and save the lost. Go out. I've given you, I've given you a message. Go out and proclaim it. Don't raise your hands. How many proclaim the message? Every moment they get, no matter what, no matter what the reaction is from the person you're giving it to. Because see, the proclamation has been given. And it's been given to us. What? The children of God. We've been given the proclamation. Oh, but Pastor Mark, I don't, oh, they're not going to listen to me. It doesn't matter. I, I, I love that, that movie. Um, I can't remember what it was, but the camp thing, Bill Murray was in it, Meatballs. And he goes, it just doesn't matter. It just doesn't matter. You've been commanded to bring a message forward. It just doesn't matter what everybody else thinks. Oh, but Pastor Mark, my feelings might get a little hurt. Wait a minute, let me get <laughs> boo hoo. It doesn't matter. You've been commanded by God Almighty. By God Almighty. So again, God was asking Jonah to hear the call and proclaim the message. Now, other definitions for kara is called dictated. Dictated, I love that. Because what's dictation? It's when somebody sits down and gives you a personal message. To what? To hand to somebody else. Personal message. Personal message. here. It's a personal message dictated to a number of people ordained by God in the Bible to what? Bring forward. Bring forward. What makes you any different? It's an honor to have a message personally dictated to you. To bring where? To bring to them. To who? Those that have no idea and are lost or distracted. Or wandering. Hey, Barbara, you're going to bring a message this week. One that's going to be personally dictated to you. You know that, don't you? We had a little discussion before service. There's going to be a message. It's going to be dictated. The, The receiver might not like the message. But you know what? Now it's their responsibility. Now it's their responsibility. I love the fact that my friend, Pastor Vreeland, his sister passed away the other day. She had cancer. She had it for a year. And then all of a sudden it was kind of interesting because 
he remembers he remembers back. This one has affected him. He's lost a couple brothers and his father and other people in his family. But this one really affected him. But it brought him back to the place where he remembered that his father didn't never wanted to hear what he had to say. His father never wanted to hear what he had to say about Christianity. And so what did Pastor Pete do? He handed him a tract. For some of you, a tract is a little booklet that tells all about Jesus. They're wicked cool. You should, if you can find them, carry them around in your car. Because when you can't open your mouth, hand that to them. So he handed that to him way back when Pastor Peter started going to Bible college. Two days before his father died, he called Pastor Peter up and he said, Peter, I want you to know I've received Christ in my life. And I'm all set to die. And you know what? It was that tract that brought me to a place of decision. And that was given many years before. You see, if we never proclaim the name, they will never hear what he has done and will do. And that's what happened way back. The Israelites forgot the name of God and they refused to proclaim him. And in that non-proclamation, the Lord was not happy. But we're not going to go there yet. <clears throat> so it's dictated, it's given, and or gives. So what's given to you gives to someone else. It invites people to what? To live. To live. It makes a proclamation. And the procl proclamation becomes renowned. It also means to offer the terms of the proclamation. What are the terms of salvation? Receive and repent. Repent and receive. There's not a lot of terms to that proclamation. Why? All have fallen short of the glory of God. There are none righteous, no, not one. Because I love it when I walk up to people and I say, hey, you know who Jesus is? No, I'm good. <laughs> no, you're not good. And you're not righteous. And you're not in right standing. It means to shout. It means to shout. It means to be summoned to. Because see, someday, those that know the truth will be summoned to return home. You think about that for a minute. How many people have you had the opportunity to have summoned with you? And you've gone, well, no, I... I love it. I, one day I walked up to somebody and I said, did you tell them? No, nah, why not? No, nah, they don't, they don't want to hear that. I said, it doesn't matter whether they want to hear it. You've been summoned to proclaim it. Oh, well, uh, uh, God knows them. Yeah, God knows they're lost. You hold the key to the freedom. His name's Jesus. Put them in the lock. We have to. Now we see in Genesis, God makes many proclamations, such as calling light day and dark night and dry earth and wet seas. We see him making those proclamations. We are called. We are called. God proclaims from the heavens, you are called, you are chosen. But few will take up the call. But how can they take it up if they've never heard it? can't. In that proclamations, the things proclaimed became. There's one last word that's part of this word, and it is the word preach. Preach.
preach comes from the word proclamation. In other words, you go out. Now, some people say, oh, man, you're, you're such a freak. You're such a Jesus freak. All you do is preach, preach, preach. Well, that's what I'm called to do. That's the proclamation. You're, ch- you're called and chosen. God's proclaimed you to go and what? Save the lost. By what? Introducing them to the Savior. We're not called to wallow in pity. We're not called to wallow in all of these things. Oh, they might not like me, Pastor Mark, and then I won't, I won't have my friend. I love this verse or this song. Oh, what a friend we have in Jesus. All our griefs and sin to bear. What a privilege it is to carry everything in God to prayer. I'm glad I remembered that because I was sitting there going, what's the rest, what's the rest? And the Lord said, I got you, I got you. See, we, we need that understanding. We need to have that understanding. Now look, I just threw my note over there and I wasn't even ready yet. Again, so Jonah, through a proclamation, was told to preach. Let's look at Daniel 5 for a minute. Turn to Daniel 5. And where'd Daniel go? Keeps roaming. All my little tabs are, oops, all my little tabs are disappearing. I'm going to have to get new tabs. There he is. All right. It's got him, it's got him under Danny. Don't ask. I don't know why. Daniel 5. Now, I know if I said, turn to Danny 5, all of you would go, what, what, what Bible's he in? Because you'd be freaking out a little bit. Uh-oh, Pastor Mark's lost his wig. He's wigging. Daniel 5, verse 15, please. And I love this. We all know what happened, because before this, we know that Belshazzar went and He's celebrating, so what did he do? He, he called his people to go get the golden goblets out of the storage, out of the storage facility. <laughs> and so they went and got them. Now, these goblets were what? Sanctified. They were sanctified. Sanctified by God for what? A purpose. They were proclaimed for a purpose. So in Daniel 5, 15, it says, because now, again, when they started drinking out of these goblets, what happened? All of a sudden, God's finger came and started writing a message on the wall. And nobody could interpret it except Daniel. Why? Daniel was chosen and ordained by God to what? Bring the message, bring the proclamation. You've heard the expression, the writing on the wall before. This is the writing on the wall. So Belshazzar says, are you Daniel? Are you that Daniel? That Daniel, not just a Daniel, that Daniel. Are you that Daniel? I've heard so much about one of the exiles brought here from Judah by my predecessor, King Nebuchadnezzar. I have been told that you possess the spirit of the Holy And see, now here's the funny thing. In your Bible, it's a little G. Notice the name's not proclaimed in the big G, the original G, the G gangsta. All right, the big G. Instead, Belshazzar uses the little G, which refers to what? Idols and false gods. that you have insight, understanding, and exceptional wisdom. Before you arrived, I had the wise men and enchanters brought before me to see if they could read this writing on the wall and tell me what it means. And not one of them was able to tell me. But it has been reported to me directly that you can offer an accurate interpretation and solve problems no one else can. 
I love it this week. I've gotten messages from message, message, messages from Pakistan. Pakistan. I've gotten messages from Africa. I've gotten messages from countries I can't mention because if it does, there'll be absolutely crazed persecution of these people. And it's kind of interesting because they say, the Lord has told us we need to follow you. And I'm like going, follow me where? Because if we're going to the store, it's a long trek to Africa. It's a long trek to Pakistan. Where are you going to follow me? He says, no, God's told We've watched you. I'm like going, I hope not at night and somebody's standing out in my yard with spy glasses. We've watched you on, 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 on the internet. And they said, it was kind of, and I'm like going, I don't even want to say this, but they said, you've been proclaimed to bring a message. And I went, I'm just, I'm just a guy from Maine that struggles every day of my life um, to hopefully do the right thing by God's will and way. And, and you know, you, you, there's more people better, you know, better ready to do this than me. They go, no, this is who God told us to follow. I said, okay. Now we have, we have, we have our friend, um, Pastor Timothy, who's just as crazy as they come, who's, who's, who's building a three-level Bible college and has no money to do it, trusting absolutely 100% in God, hallelujah, praise God, that's a man of faith. And he's got holes in the ground, he's got cement being poured, and he's got all this stuff going on, he's got Bible college students coming, and he goes, help, <laughs> pray. His exact words, pray man of God. Pray man of God, that God takes care of what we need. Because I've sat with Pastor Timothy before right here in this chapel, and we both have talked about the, the verse that says, I will never leave you or forsake you. And when Pastor Timothy built his first church, he did it without even thinking. He just said, start pouring a foundation, let's start building. And you know what? Every bit of the money came. Every bit. Before you arrived, I already read that. Channel, verse, channel 16, verse 16. But it has been reported to me directly that you can offer an accurate interpretation and solve problems no one else can. Now I will, I will offer you what I offered the others. You can read this writing and tell me what it means. You will be clothed in purple, wear a gold chain around your neck, and ascend in rank and privilege to be the third highest ranking ruler in the kingdom. In other words, if you tell me what I want to hear, you get all of this. Daniel says, keep the gifts for yourself or else award them to another. This is up to you. Still, I will agree to read the writing on the wall and tell you what it means. O king, the most high God, big G, gave sovereignty, greatness, honor, and splendor to your predecessor, Nebuchadnezzar. In other words, Nebuchadnezzar got right. He repented. God made him so great and powerful that all people, regardless of their heritage, nationality, or language, trembled in fear before them, before him. He did as he pleased, executing or sparing, honoring or shaming anyone as he wished. But there came a point when his heart was so proud and his spirit so haughty that he acted arrogantly. Hmm. In other words, he stopped proclaiming the name. Let me keep going. He lost his royal throne and was stripped of his royal honors. There's that covering I talk about. The covering was taken away. What did he do? He lost everything. Don't let your mind tell you right now, because I know some of you think of this, well, that's the Old Testament, Pastor Mark. That doesn't happen today. Want to bet? Want to bet? He was driven away from all that is human, and he took on the base instincts of an animal. He lived in the company of wild donkeys and bent over to eat grass like the oxen. Every <laughs> I just got a picture of Shackley in my mind. I'm sorry, Atlanta. <laughs> Grazing out in the front lawn. <laughs> <laughs> 
Sorry about that, but I, you know, I, I used to, I used to uh, make fun of that, and I'm, a, I'm sorry, I used to make fun of Shackley. <laughs> it's kind of interesting. It's a long story, but we won't get into it right now. And then my aunt said, "I'm a Shackley distributor." And I went, "Oh man, <laughs> I can't make fun of it anymore." So, to eat cra grass like the ox, and every night the dew of heaven fell heavy on his body and made him wet until he learned his lesson. Until he learned his lesson. How come, how come today, with everything that's happened, we haven't learned our lesson? Good question. We haven't learned our lesson. The writing's been on the wall. Honestly. Oh, Pastor Mark. <laughs> writing's on the wall people it really is wake up out of your spiritual haughtiness and figure out that huh, we've been really asinine And acknowledge that the most high God, Big G, is the true sovereign over all earthly kingdoms, and he grants authority to anyone he wishes. But even though you knew all this, you, Belshazzar, his descendant, have followed in his ways and not lived humbly. On the contrary, you have risen up against the true Lord of heaven by demanding that the sacred vessels from his temple be brought before you, and having you, your officials, your wives, your concubines, drink from them, you have issued a challenge you cannot win. Why do we think we can throw down with God? You have made toast and offered praise to the idols crafted in silver and gold, bronze, iron, wood, and stone. Idols which cannot see you, hear you, or know anything at all. If you had failed, if you have failed, and you have failed to honor in all you do, the one true God who holds the breath of life in the palm of his hand. It makes possible all your days. He is the one who sent this hand inscribed message on the wall. It was dictated for Belshazzar. And it said this, Mini Mini Tekel Parsin. I found it very interesting because as I looked this up and studied it out, it means numbered, numbered. Your days are numbered. They have been weighted and divided. Think about that for a minute. When the proclamation is not given accurately, again, what happens? The message is diluted and false. And in a false narrative, what happens? The proclamation of the name becomes less and less. So God wrote, meaning me need to kill Parson, which means number, number, your days are numbered, it's been weighted and divided, and your kingdom is going to be divided. In other words, Belshazzar, guess what? You're going to be no more. And your kingdom is going to be separated. Do you know that there is a huge separation in the body of Christ today? Huge. Why? Pride and arrogance. Because somebody's taken what's sacred. You're going to love this word in a minute. i got to find it. I'm not there yet. I'll get there in a minute. Why? Because the focus changes. The focus changes from him to us. And our feelings, our senses, and our emotions. Now listen, God has numbered the days for those that live in the sacrilege of his word, or excuse me, his proclamation. So God has your days numbered. God knows exactly what day he's going to say. Time's up. Tick, 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 tick. Boom. Hey, number 69,752 is on the way. One of you little cherubins, go in and sweep their room, make sure it's ready for them. 
I'm only kidding there. Because I know some of you going, it doesn't say that in the Bible. You're right, it doesn't. It's my imagination right there running a little crazy. But the place has been prepared. It's ready. And God, through his plan specifically, has numbered every single day, just like he numbered every hair on your head. He knew when some of you were going to lose all your hair. He knew I was going to keep mine. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to give that pastor a full head of hair because he likes his hair. I do. I love my hair. I, I think it's very nice. I, I thank God because I hate hats. <laughs> so it, it does. And you know what else? People in a crowd can go, that's that crazy pastor. <laughs> Many times, right, Crystal, we've gone out and they go, I knew it was you, Pastor Mark, because of the hair. I just like my hair long. It's just the way it is. I'm a product of the 60s. So God has numbered the days for those that live in the sacredness of his word and his proclamation. It has been weighted and found defective for those that live in the desacralization. That's the word, desacralization of the word of God. Those that have cheapened it those that have taken the value of it away. By what? By changing it. So he's telling Belshazzar, it's been weighted and found effective. And in this, the kingdom will be divided. I've got to tell you, there's so much division today. In the outside world and in this inner circle of believers, there's wicked division. Wicked division. I've said this before. It doesn't matter what you think. It's matter what God has said. It's never going to be about you. It never will be about you. It's always going to be about kingdom issues. So get over yourself. Honestly. Start putting your focus towards God. Start focusing on the throne room. Start proclaiming the name. S some of you don't remember this, but... Demons flee at the sound of what? The name of Jesus. Demons flee. Oh, but I'm a Christian pastor, Mark. They can't get me. Oh, they can play with you all day long. Right here, right through the ear gate. Oh. That's why I remember seven years ago, six years ago, we did a series on gossip. Because that's a sin, believe it or not. Oh, no, I'm just, I'm just sharing stuff, Pastor Mark. I'm, we're just talking. No, you're not. You're gossiping. You're like little chickens in a yard. Oh, did you hear about Sandy C? Did you hear about... Please, shut up. Now, Daniel's word, karez, comes from karoz, to add intensity, by heralding the proclamation. So Daniel entered into karez, and then he entered into karoz, which added intensity, which means the message was important. The proclamation was very important. Which again means to speak loudly and proudly about who you belong to. I think of the proclamation made by Nebuchadnezzar that said, when everybody heard the horn, they were to bow down to the statue of him that was made for him. But what did those three boys, those three Hebrew boys do? Absolutely not. We're going to proclaim the name of the Lord. And we're not going to bend over and kiss anybody's you know what. We're going to do exactly what God says, big G, original G. OG, that means original gangster for those of you that are a little bit too white to understand that type of language. OG, the original gangster. You have to know. They said, no, we're not going to bow down to the little OG. We're going to be faithful to the big OG. Even though... Nebuchadnezzar yelled this. God's proclamation was louder. 
don't bow down. Many of you know that the minute this whole ridiculousness came out, the first thing God said to me was, don't bow down. And we never did. We never did. We, as again, I, I used this word in a series last month, we adjusted. We adapted to the situation, and we never stopped proclaiming the name of God. Why? Thank you, but give him all the praise. Why? Because a proclamation was made. Don't put any other gods before me. Now, you know what any other god is? That's any other thing that we have to worship or idol before God. Now, the word desacralize in the Hebrew starts at the word daka, D-A-K-K-A. But it ends up at the word daka. All right. Now, daka means to crush or oppress. In Galatians 1, 1 through 10, there's two places here in this set of chapters. One is the phrase, may God's name forever receive honor. In other words, we are not to oppress it or crush it. And the other starts in verse 6. What the heck? And, and goes to verse 10. Let's go there. Turn to Galatians 1 real quick. I'm working it. Paul, commissioned directly by Jesus and God, the Father, who raised him from the dead, not as some claim, an agent of men or any person, and all the brothers and sisters with me to you, the church of Galatia. May the grace and peace of God, the Father, and the Lord Jesus, the, the Savior, live in you. He is the very Savior who rescues us from this present perverse age, dominated by evil by giving his life according to our Father's will to deal with our sins. May God's glorious name forever receive honor. Amen. Verse 6, frankly, I'm stunned. I cannot believe that you have abandoned God so quickly. Even after he called you through the grace of, of, the, of God, of Jesus, you have fallen for a different gospel. Actually, there is only one true gospel of Jesus and God and you because of divisive prodding by others are accepting a distorted version which is not the gospel at all. No matter the source of the false gospel, even if it is preached by us or a heavenly messenger, ignore it. May those who add to our sub or add to or subtract here it comes. May those who add or subtract from the gospel of Jesus be eternally cursed. Listen again. If anyone preaches to you a gospel other than what you have accepted, may he find himself cursed. Do you think I care about the oh here it comes? Do you think I care about the approval of men? or about the approval of God. I could give a rat's flying fanny what anybody thinks of me. I've come to that place. Because I'm not going to stand before you, but I am going to stand before the Lord. And I'm going to have to give him an account for everything I have not done inside of his what? Proclamation. And what's going to do it? His word. Do you hear me? His word. Not your word, not the words you think are his words, but his words. And I think for the last many services we have said that, that it would be his word. <clears throat> so do you think I care about the approval of men or about the approval of God? Do you think I am on a mission to please people? If I'm still spinning my wheels trying to please men, then there is no way I can be a servant of God or Jesus, the one who has liberated. There's another word I want to just briefly touch on, and we'll go a little bit deeper in it probably next Sunday. It's the word kerubma. It is the proper proclamation or the preaching or heralding of the foundational fundamentals of the gospel. Now, 
there's words like theology, eschatology, and all these different things. And I found this in one of my studies, Kerugma, because it's the proper proclamation, not a dreamed up false wish list of stupidity, but it's the proper proclamation or the preaching or hel heralding of the foundation, the foundational fundamentals of the gospel. It's the truth, not fiction. It comes from Caruso, and it means to preach with conviction. Yeah, he's Jesus. Yeah, I accepted him. Yeah, my life's been wonderful, except for this and this and this and this. Is there any conviction in that? My life was crap. And then I found Jesus. And I was stubborn. But he kept, he kept doing this. He kept tapping my chest to get my notice. And then all of a sudden, one day I said, all right, Lord, I, I, I'll receive you and I'll accept you. And oh, my God, you can't believe the change. It's better than, yeah, I accepted Jesus. Yeah, my life still sucks. Every day with the Lord is an adventure. Every day is like going to the amusement park and seeing that they put up a brand new roller coaster. And I hate roller coasters because I get vertigo. And a roller coaster ride for me is like a bad dream. But every day is an adventure. Every single day. I never know what God's going to bring. But I have to say, Lord, I'm yours. You're mine. So it doesn't matter. Because every day is amazing. Even if the day has a little bit of a question mark in it. But it's amazing because he knows the answer. And I have to walk by faith and trust completely in him. I have to rely on the foundational fundamentals of the gospel that he's taught me through the Holy Spirit. That's how it works. And then since I am witness to that, then what do I get to do? Through conviction, go out and tell everybody else. That's how it works. In all authority given by God to bring an accountability to the hearer. Did you hear me? You're going to tell with conviction what he has done to you. And now you're going to make them, oh, here comes that word. With Everybody hates to hear this. Them accountable. See? Now they're accountable. But up until that time, you're accountable. You're accountable to bring the word. But Pastor Mark, I don't want to be accountable. If I'm stupid, then I'm not accountable. Then I can just claim ignorance. You claim ignorance at the Bema seat. I want to see that. I'm going to make sure I watch that. <laughs> oh, no, God. I, I, I didn't know. Being stupid is okay sometimes. I, be, you know, the stupid game, sometimes I pretend like I don't really know, but I know, but I don't want people to know I know. And so sometimes I just go, really? And I do that for a reason. Because sometimes you get more depth of the conversation if you don't know anything. Because then people claim up and they go, oh, you already know. Oh, no, I don't know. See? Because I, if I'm going to talk with somebody, I want the root of the problem. I don't, I don't want the skin cream. I want the root. Because only the Lord deals with the root. See? And if the root's healed, then what happens? If you have a bad bulb and you're planting some, your, your bush is going to come out looking a little bit ridiculous. But if the bulb is right and it's planted right and it's been worked right, then the, then the blossom comes out amazing. We have this friendly little chipmunk, bang, bang, which uh, <laughs> likes to chew all of my wife's bulbs. We had a beautiful hibiscus, and then one day we came out and it's leaning down. And we picked it up and there's nothing left of the ball. I go, what the heck? I said, days are numbered. The, the balance has been weighted. <laughs> there will be division in the kingdom. I didn't tell you how I got rid of it. <sighs> in all authority given by God to bring an accountability to hear it, it is the gospel in action, egalizio, which stresses the victory found in the proclamation giving totally 
to his good news. So somebody hears it, they get excited because your excitement through your conviction is there. It stresses your, your, your conviction, stresses the, the victory that's found within this in proclaiming the name. And what happens? They give in totally to that. They give in totally to that. But you got to proclaim the name. You got to proclaim the name. That's the key. That's the key. That's why we're in the situations that we are today. I'm not going to go into this whole big thing, but that's why we're here today. Not here, but here. Because what happened? We desacralized the name of God. We've tried to change the words. We've tried to change the position. We've tried to change the meaning. And just like God said to Belshazzar, guess what? I'm not happy. I'm not happy. See, now there's this crowd on the side that wants to go, oh, no, that's not God. He's all up. Then you're telling me that his word is wrong, which is obviously a lie straight from the pit of hell, and you keep believing that. Because I'll tell you what when they stopped proclaiming the name, all hell broke loose. Babylon, the Babylonians, the Assyrians, the Egyptians, all because the name was not proclaimed. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. We've got communion. <clears throat> Woo, what an opening salvo. I'm excited. That's like both, both barrels going off at once. So, Father, we 